Hello everybody and welcome to our very last problem in our second workbook. Here we are once more in a world of multiple linear regression using our dummy variables for categorical information, which in this case is going to be used in a way to perform the same kind of an ANOVA exercise as we did in module 13. And so here we can see I'm just copying from problem 13-1a, and I've got the original data set here so we can take a look at that as well. So let's just jump into this one. White tooth is developing an additive for its line of toothpaste that is designed to whiten teeth in as little time as possible. Currently has two variations of the additive, type A, type B, but only wishes to produce and market one of them. So they've got some focus groups, 28 people in each, some of them given type A, some type B, and some are given this placebo. Each person is asked to use the toothpaste and record how long it takes before their teeth turn white. Okay, so here we've put this together as a regression model. Now, to refresh our memory, what did this look like when we first encountered this problem is something like this. So here we had our three samples, type A toothpaste, type B, and the control group. We had our sample means, we calculated, remember this grand mean, and the test that we were performing here was to determine whether or not mu A is equal to mu B is equal to mu C. So type A, type B, and C for the control. The alternative, not all are equal. So this is the original test. Now, how can we take this test and transform it into something that we can use a regression methodology for? Well, here's that model. Now, we're using dummy variables. We have, remember, three categories. So k equals three. I have the type A, the type B, and the control. So if I have three categories, how many dummy variables do I need? I need k minus one, two dummy variables. Because we always have that base case picks up, in this case, the third. So here we have defined the placebo, the control group, as the base case. TA identifies type A, TB identifies type B. So here's our regression results. Now, Let's just go through a little bit about how this relates to our ANOVA. So here our, our dependent variable is the number of days. So the average number of days before our teeth start, start to whiten. So our model looks something like this. Beta zero, beta one type A, beta two type B. So if we're thinking about this in the context of this ANOVA. Here I have mu A, mu B, mu C. Well, how can I relate this into that same kind of thinking that, you know, hopefully we're still familiar with that. Well, if we're looking at how we've defined our dummy variables, I have these two dummies, T A, T B. I have three categories. I have the placebo, which is the control. I have the type A, and I have the type B. This might also be helpful to think, remember those are x1, x2, right? Those are those independent variables in the context of our model. So for the control, remember we've defined the control as being the base case. So both of those take on a value of zero. Type A, we've defined X1 here as type A, and type B, we've defined X2 as identifying type B. So if I'm coming back here and I'm looking at, well, what is the expected number of days, the average number of days for, let's start with the control. Well, if that's the case, both of those dummy variables take on a value of zero. And so the expected number of days or the average number of days for our, the teeth to go white with the control is given by beta zero. Well, this of course is, if we 
translate this into our previous notation from module 13 ANOVA, well, this is therefore mu c. What is our best guess? What is our estimate of mu c in the context of this regression analysis? We're estimating beta 0 with b0. And so that will be our x bar c, that point estimate. Now, similarly, our expected days for type A. Well, if we're looking at type A, that dummy variable now takes on a value of 1, which means the average number of days it takes for the teeth to whiten for those using toothpaste 1 is beta 0 plus beta 1. And so in the notation that we're familiar with, that is going to be mu a. So this implies that beta 1 is a, a, a measurement of a difference. And that's the same as all of the other dummy variable exercises that we've done. The coefficient on the dummy is always telling you the difference in the, the, value, of the, in the, uh, the value of the dependent variable, the difference in the value of the dependent variable between your level of interest in that categorical relative to the base case. So here, that beta 1 is the difference in the value of the dependent variable, so the average number of days, between type A and the control. And so here are our estimates, B0, B1, and that would be X bar A. Finally, the average number of days for those teeth to turn white for type B. Well, now back up here in our model, TA has a value of zero, TB has a value of one. So that's given by B0 plus B2. Those would be, oops, not mu C, those would be mu B. And that's estimated by B0, B2, which would be X bar b. So once again, those coefficients on dummies are the difference in the average value comparing your, your level of the categorical of interest, which in this case now we're looking at type b, compared always to the base case, which was that control group. Okay, so if we look at what is it we're trying to achieve, mu a, mu b, mu c, well then all that we're looking at are different pairs of our coefficients. So let me just break this apart into, you know, something that maybe we're familiar with. You might be reminded of a Fisher's LSD when I go through this. Because for this first part, let me just write, rewrite this up here. So now I have a mu a, a mu b, and mu c. So if the null hypothesis is true, well, if mu a is equal to mu b, so if mu a, whoops, that's not what I meant to do. If mu a is equal to mu b, so that means that these two terms must be equal to each other. So beta 0 plus beta 1 is equal to beta 0 plus beta 2. Well, those just cancel out and I'm left with beta 1 equal to beta 2. Okay, so that's part of it, is that beta 1 and beta 2 would be equal to each other. That would contribute to the null being true, but there's more to it than just that. It's also comparing not just mu a and mu b, right? This was comparing mu a equal to mu b, but it's also comparing mu a to mu c. And so if mu a is equal to mu c, well, now I'm comparing those. Mu a is beta 0, beta 1. Mu c is beta 0, which means that if mu a is equal to mu c, well, it must be the case that beta 1 is equal to 0. Finally, if I compare mu b to mu c. Well, so now I'm comparing, not that one, 
Now we're comparing this. There's mu b and we're comparing that to mu c. And so mu b is given by beta 0 plus beta 2 is equal to that control. And so here we see beta 2 must be equal to 0. So if the null hypothesis is true, there's three things that must hold. If the null is true, it means that mu a is equal to mu b. It means that mu a is equal to mu c, so beta 1 is equal to beta 2, beta 1 is equal to 0, and mu b is equal to mu c, which means beta 2 is equal to 0. So these three different equalities must hold for the null hypothesis to be true. Well, where have we seen that before? Beta 1 equal to beta 2, and they're both equal to 0. Well, if I come back up here and I look at these results, well, isn't that just the null hypothesis for our f-test? That beta 1 and beta 2 are equal to each other and they're both equal to 0. The alternative, not all, are equal. So here we can see how we can take that module 13 ANOVA, we can put it together as a regression model, and we can run it as such, and we can get exactly the same results. You'll have to go back and look at your results for the module 13 problem, and you'll see the p-value is identical. And so here we find that we reject the null hypotheses. Not all of them are equal. Okay, well, if that's the case, in that ANOVA exercise, what's the next thing that you do when you reject the null hypotheses? Not all of them are equal. Ah, well, that's when you go ahead and you perform a Fisher's LSD. Now, using regression methods, we won't be able to do a complete Fisher's LSD. But the purpose of this exercise isn't to show you how to perform those ANOVAs using uh, regression analysis. The purpose of this exercise, of course, is to show you the similarities between these two approaches to hopefully deepen your understanding of how they work. So the regression method of performing an ANOVA is a little bit limited when it comes to the Fisher's LSD. Because here I can see as we went through breaking apart this F-test, which was the equivalent of the null and alternative hypotheses for the ANOVA itself. Well, in doing so, we formulated the three tests that would be required for the Fisher's LSD. And certainly this one here, and this one here, we already have the results for those. The one that we don't get from our regression analysis is the result for this one. The fact that we reject it on the F-test, yes, that means that at least one of them is different from zero. It doesn't mean that there's any equality or any similarity between them. So I don't have any results for that particular combination comparing type A and type B. But I do have the results comparing A and C and B and C. So comparing them to that base case scenario. And those are found right here in those p-values. Because again, remember, these are the point estimates of the difference values. And so here I have found that that difference between type A and the, and the control is statistically different from zero. That exercise is right here, where we compared, let's find a different color, where we compare type A and type C. That color was a poor choice of color. Comparing mu A and mu C, that test is done by performing a t-test on beta 1. Is that difference equal to zero, yes or no? And here we found Yes, it is different from zero. So that difference, so type A is statistically different from 
the control. And similarly, comparing type B to the control, well, that test is performed by the t-test on that beta 2. Is it equal to 0 or not? And here we found that, yes, it is different from 0. So we have gone through a complete ANOVA exercise, including most of the Fisher's LSD. What we don't have here is the results to this test. We, we could get those results. We would have to redefine our base case and redo this regression, and then we would be able to, to determine whether or not I have evidence to show a difference between our two types of toothpaste. I would set up maybe type A as my base case, and then I would get that result. So let's go through each of the individual requirements of this exercise just so that we can tick it off as done. Our estimated regression equation, 7.33 minus 1.33 type A minus 1.78 type B. What do all of these coefficients mean? Remember, here that's 7.33, that's our intercept. That's our intercept. That should be my point estimate of the average for the control. So 7.33, if I come back down here, well, there it is. There's that point estimate for the control. Now when I look at the coefficient on type A, minus 1.33, well, if I look at 7.33 minus 1.33, well, that gives me, once again, 7.33 plus that negative 1.33. That gives me 6. What is 6? My point estimate of type A. So that coefficient of 1.33, negative 1.33, says that on average, those who were using the type A toothpaste, their teeth whitened in 1.33 days less, or 1.33 days faster than those that were using the control. The next one is for type B, negative 1.78. And so here again, we have that 7.33, that was the intercept, minus that coefficient, 1.78. And so here I have 7.33 minus 178, 5.55. Where do we see 5.55? Well, there's a little bit of rounding error, but there it is. So that coefficient, of negative 1.78 tells me that those who were using the type B toothpaste saw their teeth whiten in 1.78 days less than those that were using the control. So we've got our, our coefficients are all these point estimates of the difference values. Now, keep in mind also that we can compare type A and type B. What is our point estimate of the average difference between those? And remember, for that I would take the point estimate uh, of type A. Let me use the proper notation here. Well, that's fine. Type A minus type B. Those intercepts cancel out. And so I have negative 133 minus that negative 178. And so that gives me, oops, 1.33 plus 178, 0 0.45. So those that were using the type B toothpaste saw their teeth whiten in 0.45 days less, or 0.45 days faster on average than those that were using the type A toothpaste. 
Whether or not that is statistically different from zero, we don't know. We don't have that information from this exercise. We would need to redo this exercise using a different base case. Again, if I use the type A toothpaste as the base case, then I would be able to compare type B to type A. But the way that this model has been developed, that is the one comparison that we are unable to test specifically. Okay, similarly, we have those interval estimates for the difference. So again, our point estimate, those that were using the type A saw their teeth whiten in 1.33 days less than those using the control. I'm 95% confident that using the type A toothpaste will whiten your teeth in between 2.6 and 0.07 days faster than the control. Similarly, I'm 95% confident that those that were using the type B toothpaste saw their teeth whiten in between 3 and 0.5 days faster than those that were using the control, uh, the, the, the placebo in the control group. Okay, so we've gone through our equation. We have interpreted those intervals and the coefficients. And we've had, in fact, that was the first thing we did, an extensive talk about all of those p-values and all of the testing and what all of that means. So that's it. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope this video and all of the videos from these workbooks have been extremely helpful and are helping you get through your statistics course. Thank you so much for watching. Greatly appreciated. Uh, good luck in your course and take care. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.